So with the ongoing wave um, of the pandemic registered in several countries, we have seen that COVID-19 continue to impact people globally more uh, so more so for women and young young people. It is therefore really very important that we to critically review the specific impact of COVID uh, on the women and our youth to enable the development of um, response measures that avoid widening existing inequality. So this panel will really discuss the impact of COVID-19 on uh, young on the youth and the women and identify the measure to avoid the widening inequalities. Uh, first of all, let me, before we get started, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to this esteemed panel that I have here with me. First of all, I'm going to start with Eunice Baguma Ball. I hope I say your name correctly. And she's a founder of Africa Technology Network, the Technology Business Network, and is passionate about female entrepreneurship and digital innovation in Africa. Second, I have Dr. Erin Uchono Menya. Did I say that right? <laughs> I hope I didn't put your name. I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, and uh, so she's a director of the AIMS teacher training program for the um, AIMS Global Network. And also, I do have Dr. David Jang, uh, Mr. David Jang. He's a founder as uh, Bliss Executive of Social Enterprise Management uh, Consulting that is geared uh, towards helping small business in Africa. Welcome to all of you guys. I'm going to start with you, um, uh, Eunice, if you do not mind. Um, so what I have um, right now, you know, just trying to figure out based on what I just said, how is COVID-19 rolling back the gains on women's social economic empowerment and what measure do you think could be adopted to prevent that domestic violence that we see uh, in the, in the women, especially in the rural areas? Yeah. Thank you, Ndeya, for the uh, introduction and, and welcome to my fellow panelists. So like you said in my introduction, my work focuses around digital entrepreneurship, digital innovation. So I'll kind of be commenting from that perspective. And where I see um, the impact of COVID has really done damage and started to roll back some of the gains that we've made is around, you know, when you look at, um, you know, sort of the, the impact on, you know, domestic roles and, and distribution. So a lot of more women's work was interrupted by the pandemic. Uh, women had to, you know, a, a lot of the time, so was evident even in my family, had to take the role of staying at home. I think the, the issues uh, touching on education are very close to what um, has just been outlined by the first panelist. And as she said towards the end, when she was, uh, she was ending, she's talked about an intersection of so many things that have uh, been put, uh, I mean, exposed more because of the pandemic. And one of the things that um, is obviously an issue and is uh, of concern and a focus to many people is the availability of uh, the infrastructural tools that uh, students would need to learn in the new normal that has been created by the COVID-19. So there's a lot of conversation around um, how do we ensure that access uh, is enhanced um, during this time um, and during the uh, COVID-19 uh, school instigated uh, school breaks. Uh, many, uh, good enough, many countries are beginning to open back the schools and get back their students back to physical learning. But even that is still not very um, solid. There is a lot of uncertainty that is still uh, surrounding the opening of school. And so there's a little, uh, there's still a, little, a lot of reliance on tapping into the um, ICT and digital infrastructure to do that. And the question here, uh, when we think about it, um, COVID-19 has kind of brought an additional layer in terms of the gender, uh, the gender inequalities when it comes to edu uh, education. And in this case, for us as an institution, African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, we're very keen about mathematics and sciences. And uh, so we're very keen to look at what does it mean to, um, facilitate, to foster, and to work with the uh, stakeholders. There was a sense that um, many of us, or we were forced to very quickly think about the technology and the different gadgets and the different platforms and the different tools. And that was good to try and ensure there was still conversation going on around uh, education. And we know, especially for uh, scientists, that even before COVID, um, there's, uh, we would say there was um, segregation in terms of curricular areas 
we tend to say that the girls tend to do better in their reading and their literacy, and then there's a little bit of a gap in most areas when it comes to stances. Of course, it's not um, equal in all areas. So as an institution in, during this break, I did a teacher training program in Rwanda, and one of the things that happened was that even in terms of training the teachers, our interventions were interrupted because of COVID before we, you know, what we want, I mean, we largely did it. But we also, I mean, when I talk about COVID, I, I talk about the challenges, but I also talk about, I mean, I also celebrate the opportunities that yeah. came with COVID. The things that are, because of COVID, we've been forced to think about, and actually they are actually strengths or a boost in the arm for us. So I think for us, in addition to talking about infrastructure, talking about access to digital tools, one of the things that we're keen about as an institution is how to amplify the conversation around the reimagining pedagogy. How should pedagogy look like in the situation, in the new normal of um, COVID-19? We are talking about either students learning at home using whichever ICT platform we're talking about, or students have gone back home gone back to school and they, are, they find themselves in a new setup where teachers have masks on, teachers can't closely interact with the students, students are supposed to keep their social distance and they're supposed to mask themselves throughout. So the big question is what does this have in learning and learning in our case in terms of maths and sciences and that's part of where we really see ourselves positioning ourselves to add value to the conversation especially in the African context. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor. It's it's really really very important, you know, that amplifying and also like, okay, how do we how do we start the conversation? I mean, I think it's wonderful that we're getting the teachers ready, but also how do we all work together and get you know the student also be ready for the post COVID because that will be this will be over someday. Like, how do we prepare our student for that? So that's that's really wonderful. Thank you for that. I would like to acknowledge the Foster. We're happy to have you here. And also, I would like to tell the audience, you know, please feel free to ask any question you have via the chat. I'll make sure that also that we all engage you as well. Um, you know, based on what Dr. Herino just said, um, what opportunities do you see, you know, around this, um, you know, like getting children ready, the youth and women ready for the post-COVID? Um, what do you see the opportunity for the existing existing businesses really to take the measures that will ensure that our youth in Africa have access to the educational necessity uh, so that they can thrive today and, uh, and, and tomorrow. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, I think, you know, COVID will, will, will end, you know, the, the post-COVID era would come, fortunately, mm -hmm. sooner than we think. Mm -hmm. uh, but education and learning will remain what they are. You know, that's not going to change. Mm -hmm. uh, what COVID did was change the way we we implement, administer, provide, you know, uh, education and learning. Uh, so going forward, my take is that um, we need to, and we all know within, within Africa that we, we have some issues with uh, the implementation of, you know, education and, and provision of, of learning. So going forward, I think the opportunity is, you know, that, um, well, technology aside, because I've heard you talked about quite a lot, and I agree that technology is just, is just a tool. Uh, but I think we we should be back to the, you know, it's, it's an opportunity to actually fix, you know, the fundamentals that, that, that were sort of wrong with our educational system, because what COVID has done really is to expose, you know, the, the fundamentals that were wrong already. <laughs> Uh, and that these fundamentals include the, 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 the nature of, of curriculum uh, and, and, and the quality of education. So my take is that yes, we should continue to encourage we should continue to encourage access to education, which is what technology does, basically that children can still learn, the young and the youth can still learn, you know, irrespective of the lockdown. So that's access. But at the same time, we have an opportunity to look at issues of quality and particularly relevance. Uh, because these are two issues, relevance of education. These are two issues that we have sort of ignored for a long time. And I see the, the opportunity for, for our, our young people not only to be uh, recipients of, of, of the new normal, but also being part of creating that new normal mm -hmm. uh, in terms of creating the, the, the technological opportunities, innovation, to creating the new ways, you know, that, uh, that, that we, teach, we teach and learn. 
So for me, uh, COVID has, number one, exposed the, the weaknesses in our systems, but also created the opportunity for us to reboot uh, and go into it and look at how we can better use technologies that we have uh, not not waiting for, for the 5G or even even 4G, you know, but the technologies that exist and finding ways, you know, to redesign curriculum and to and to teach, you know, our, our young people better, teach them in, in ways that, you know, become make them more relevant and more productive uh, right. within the within the African economy. Right. Um, that you, you, you end up on a very important point. How do we make the curriculum more relevant? bring the quality and what is it that you know specifically that we could be done right now to be prepared you know for for tomorrow right um what do you see like uh, a work with maybe is, is it with the governments is it with all the private sector institution what what do you feel like could be or is it like international um partnership what do you what do you see as a the tone needs to be set by policy at the end of the day, uh, yeah. because policy guides, you know, education development and delivery of education. So that that needs to be the, the main guide. Mm -hmm. So the, the the policymakers in the continent, you know, who are responsible for education, for employment, for entrepreneurship, for innovation, you know, needs to need to ensure that you know the curriculum, yes, is is of high quality and deliverable. But at the same time, the content should be relevant to what the continent needs. Got it. You know, because because uh, my, my experience and observation so far has been that we, we formulate policies sort of to, I mean, we all talk about the 21st century skills, you know, so we train in the, the young for, for the 21st century skills. But then we still have 20th century problems. <laughs> you know, and uh, I mean, if you have ever gone to a mechanic in any part of Africa or, or hired a carpenter, you realize the skills that we need for the 21st century. So mm -hmm. the point is that, you know, we need to be able to fix where we're coming from, you mm -hmm. know, in terms of the way that we train the youth and also to add on, you know, what is relevant for the continent and actually not maybe not even for the whole continent, but for each country, yes. you know, and, you know, to, to look at okay, what what do we need? Mm -hmm. And we, we, we know now with, 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 with COVID and with the disruptions in the, uh, in the global supply chain, you know, and, and the competent, we know what we need. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we know that, well, it's, it's, it may not be possible in situations like this to import what we need from wherever. So we need to be able to learn to make these things, you yeah. know. So, so I think the curriculum should encourage a lot of knowing, which is traditional learning, mm -hmm. but we need to put in a lot of doing as well. You know that we teach these young people to be able to do not yeah. just to know and understand so that relevance comes in in terms of what is needed what the market needs and i'm not belittling the significance of training uh, our young to to chase the frontier of science that that's fine you know we need more of them to be chasing you know in biotechnology you know genetics you know to chase the frontier of science to do what is possible but i think we should also yeah. encourage them to do what is needed you know, right. to, to solve the problems that we are in today in terms of relevance. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for that. I think it's a very good point, you know, about what is needed and every country is different. So it's like has to be tailored on a country by country basis. Uh, on that point, let me get to David. Uh, welcome back. Can you hear us now? Thank you. Yes, I can hear you. So, David, um, I just would like to get your thought around what uh, Foster just said, you know, uh, in Gambia, you know, what effort has been done so far and is there anything that uh, that you learned that could be shared, you know, uh, across um, the continent as well? It sounds like you had some very successful um, outcome. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much. In, in Gambia, um, realize that um, a private sector plays a key role in, in every situation that the country is facing. So um, we had efforts that have been led by the Gambia Chamber of Commerce to raise funds um, to support COVID-19. We did that through a telethon and through members, and uh, we were able to raise about uh, more than uh, 400,000 400, uh, US dollars. And these efforts, um, we, we renovated the sanatorium which served as the center, we also realized that there were also other vulnerable groups that actually um, were facing serious challenges like um, the prisoners. So we knew that the prisoners may not come in contact with people, but uh, they come in contact with prison officers. 
So due to that, um, we work with the UNDP to get um, a bus for prison officers, which will transport them and ensure there's social distancing so that they are not infected with the virus uh, to be able to ensure that uh, the prisoners don't get infected. Other vulnerable groups like uh, persons with disability too, we, we looked at them because um, they're also being affected. So, so we looked at them to see how best we can support them um, with little packages that will be able to you know, help them to, to stimulate them um, during this period because in most cases um, they've been ignored. You know, these are very key people that play a key role in our society that most of the time, you know, we don't look at them. And another thing that we realized was um, there's a switch, there's a loss in jobs in some aspects and there's a gain um, increase in, in jobs in other aspects. For example, if you look at uh, manufacturing, um, in not only in Gambia, but across Africa, manufacturing sector um, has been widely um, employing women and youth. And um, due to COVID also, it has been affecting uh, the manufacturing sector, the agricultural sector. But another sector that we see there's increase is the ICT sector uh, uh, because everybody is trying to live in the new normal where people are trying to um, do business and trade online. So you see because of this, there are opportunities for young people that are in the ICT sector. But primarily the people that are also affected is the informal sector. Mm -hmm. Because people who are employed in the formal sector will, will gain benefits, you know, you will gain social security benefits or other forms of benefits. But this doesn't come with the informal sector, even though, you, you know, those in the formal sector, you're not working, your salary keeps rolling. But the informal sector, if you stay at home during the lockdown, it affects you. And we need to understand that the market women are primarily mostly focused in the uh, informal sector and the youth. Mm -hmm. So these sectors really have been hit badly. I think there's a huge need to really look at issues um, relating to bankruptcy because if you look at it, I can tell you there have been huge loss of jobs, um, not only in Gambia but across the continent. And um, these loss of jobs, some businesses have gone bankrupt. So what policy measures um, can we put in place as a continent and as countries to ensure that we are addressing bankruptcy, we are addressing people to be able to get back to their jobs and, and, and get decent jobs to be able to help economies um, across the continent. And these um, and other efforts that the, the Gambia Chamber of Commerce, including other sector leaders, are really looking at in, in Gambia. Thank you, David, you know, and uh, congratulations on that effort, you know, and you are absolutely right around the, um, you know, the informal sector. A lot of women, a lot of, a lot of youth in there. What can we do? What can we learn from COVID right now? And the gap that Foster had uh, mentioned, how can we leverage that to actually be prepared and, 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 and create opportunity for those because uh, the situation is really terrible for them. So thank you for sharing. Um, um, Eunice, I'm going to get back to you. And uh, you talked about the digital divide uh, among women. And I was just curious, like, what mitigation from your perspective and innovative recovery measures could be put in place to avoid the widening of those inequalities? Yeah, I think, uh, and again, just very good point uh, made uh, all around. Um, you know, from my perspective, I think one of the things that really needs to, to start happening is investing in digital skills. And I think right now, um, the, the conversation around including women in STEM has been more of how do we get women into technology fields? Um, mm -hmm. I think the conversation needs to shift towards how do we take technology to people and to women and to you know, marginalized groups wherever they are. So, uh, you know, like David was talking about, uh, was, was already, has already mentioned, a lot of women are already working in these informal sectors. How do we digitalize those sectors? Because I think mm -hmm. a lot of the time the focus is how do we get women to be more into programming? How do we get them into, you know, this, this tech field? But, you know, we need to think about how do we get informal businesses, people that are selling fruits in the market, people, how do we get them to actually have the digital skills to allow them to continue their business and to leverage digital skills to continue. So I think that, sh that shift towards making technology inclusive, taking technology to people, to, to sectors, you know, uh, increasing digitalization. I think, you know, the mobile phones were a start. You know, most people now have mobile phones. Most people are now using it for personal, um, 
for personal communication, for, you know, financial. Now we really need to make the shift in terms of towards for business and for work. I mm. really unlocking the potential of the power of what, what people have in their hands already, which are mobile phones, for education, for business, etc. So I think that shift, I think, you know, policy-wise will need to happen across, um, you know, things like incorporating digital curriculum, even in vocational schools, for example, um, uh, to really kind of make, uh, accelerate that, 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 that shift. Um, I think the other thing that needs to really happen is um, increasing, you know, making participation within the digital economy much more uh, inclusive. So again, tying into the additional schools, how do we tie those with the right support, whether it's around entrepreneurship, whether it's around careers, really. And I think there's also really need to be a, a shift around culture because I think it was uh, Dr. Irene who said, you know, we are talking to educators, we also need to talk to students. But, you know, on the other hand, we also need to talk to families because I think what happened is there was a drive around educate the girl child and the, the message was send her to school, right? So there was some protection, some protection that kind of availed the girl child while she's at school. You know, she's not going to be interrupted, she's not going to be called to do house chores, etc. But now if, if learning is moving back into the home setting, how do we, how do we make that message that, you know, if she's now studying, don't say, oh, go and collect water versus your brother, because this totally changes the dynamic. I think there was that protection of you went to school, you had to be there at a certain time. So maybe that time was kind of protected. But there's a, a colleague of mine who, who did some research into how girls use a, a, a mobile phone for, la for revision. And she said, you know, when they compared with boys and girls, girls struggled to use it simply because they had so many other responsibilities and chores at home. Yes. compared to boys who are not really able to make that shift. So at school, they were fine, they were peers, but at home, there's a difference. So I think now as part of that conversation and even around policy, the messaging, because I remember growing up seeing those messages around, you know, send girls to school. Now the messaging needs to be much more holistic of, you know, prioritize girls' education wherever it's happening, whether it's at home or at school. So I think some of those, those are some of the shifts I think that we need to see um, to start really incorporating uh, the new normal. And I really think it's, it starts from the grassroots with culture and really bringing the conversation uh, into, you know, into the societal uh, forefront. Yes. And I really love what you just said around, you know, um, shifting the culture. Uh, we have to really think differently. And how might we do that now that, you know, the education now is sh has shifted to home. Then I'm going to ask Dr. Herring, um what are your thoughts? I feel like, you know, maybe women really need to be empowered and be part of that conversation into policy shaping because they have like so much um, responsibility or even like leadership in their own home. So how might we invest in the leadership of women uh, and empower them to participate into and contribute to the design of those policy measures? Thank you. Um, and it's very, um um, the insights coming from the various uh, panelists is really uh, building. And I think uh, your question about um, how is it that women can be part of the policy conversations. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use an example from our teacher training program. Um, so as I said, we, we, teach, we train teachers and during this COVID-19 break, we had to shift from our physical training to on, online training. And one of the things, um, that was a, that's a key characteristic of a training program, um, even before COVID, was that uh, we always said uh, we do not work on teachers, we work with teachers. And so even before the COVID-19 outbreak, we had uh, champion teachers who, who consulted every step of the way. There, there's no intervention that would come up with and want to implement without consulting the teachers this group of champion teachers having conversations with them, testing and hearing their feedback in terms of the feasibility, uh, the con uh, how relevant it is con uh, in terms contextually in terms of their classroom. And of course, taking into consideration that within Africa uh, and perhaps even other countries, we tend to have different tiers of schools. We have schools that are more endowed with resources. We have other schools that really uh, ha have less resources and perhaps higher population. So it, that's something that 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 we built as a key characteristic of our of, of, of our, our program. And ideally, uh, part uh, during the COVID nineteen break, as we shifted to online, we stood out as one of the programs that was able to continue in a very massive way, even within such a short time. And what helped us was again 
that pool of teachers, we had like an army outside there who, um, for example, the first thing we had to do was to mobilize all the teachers and register them um, on WhatsApp groups. And we had 52 different WhatsApp groups to get these teachers on. And we couldn't handle it as a team in the office. The people who helped galvanize the fellows teachers and look for them and talk to them and get them online on to the WhatsApp groups were the fellow teachers. And of course, so so one of the things that I saw, uh, and to respond to your question about how do we get women to be part of this conversation is first and foremost, giving them those leadership roles right from the grassroots level within the context where, where they function. And the good thing about uh, in, 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 when you talk about online training that of course, quote unquote, was forced upon us by COVID was such that, of course, the people who are cut out because they don't have the smartphones and they, they don't have the computers. But for those who then had the smartphones, um, with the help of the fellow teachers, and as the teachers, as we pushed more responsibility to them, as we called them on the side to have side trainings for them. So there's that sense of empowerment, very deliberate empowerment processes that has to be built. Um, I remember the teachers are starting off and saying, how are we even going to do this remote training? I, I do not have the capacity or that sense of, uh, I do not have the capacity to sit down and follow it on my own. Or a lady teacher saying, you know, um, um, so my neighbors will come visiting and you want me to follow the training, you know. But one of the things that helped was just creating an open con line of conversation. So we'd have, have sessions where we'd allow them to air these issues and respond to these issues we created a scaffold around them, for example, making sure we almost had a timetable that structured, this is the time we're supposed to do this, this is the time we're supposed to do this, and that helped them plan themselves. But we were also very sensitive to their needs. So, for example, at the beginning, we started off by saying, we'd have sessions in the morning, and then they said, no, you know, in the morning, we have to do ABCD, so it might be better if we shift it at in the afternoon, but we need to uh, end a little earlier because we have to go and prepare our meals. So just being responsive to their needs and keeping tweaking all that. And what we have observed with our champion teachers, especially that the ladies that were in that group that started at the point where they were not very confident with using their, their phones, they couldn't believe they could uh, set up teams meetings and facilitate meetings. <laughs> the sense of confidence that they have, the yeah. sense of um, leadership capacity that they have, that now we they can host leaders from their districts. They can engage with them and interact with them. So I think the first thing is, first and foremost, creating space and additional, making the table wider and making getting more of the women to the table alongside the male, because I think it is important for them to do that, that alongside the male counterparts, interact and see, you know, it's not just me who is, in, uh, who is struggling, uh, but at the same time, I have somebody else I can reach out to. And then continuously supporting them, tracking what the weak areas are, responding to those situations, and modeling. I think one of the things they said was the issue of modeling the process. It, I think it was very helpful for my team that I was there as a leader and I was a woman. And I would engage them very closely. I would tell them how I have scheduled my time. I'm working at home and this is the way I've scheduled my time. These are the struggles I'm going through. Yeah. And uh, we had to talk about soft ad adaptive motivational patterns like resilience and persistence. So we would acknowledge the challenges, we would not push them aside, but we'd yeah. have to encourage them and say, you, know, you have to find ways of overcoming. You might do a little extra. You might not be like that man who can climb up the tree to get internet, but what else can you do? So just creating that nurturing environment that eventually shifts, makes a cultural, um, I would say an attitudinal shift, and imbues them with more knowledge and skills, and therefore boosts, um, boosts their confidence, and then creating opportunity for them to begin um, in, in, in a very protected way and gradually in a way that now they can stand on their feet, talk and speak amongst their peers. Then I think uh, what we're seeing with our teachers is that now they can stand, sit alongside the policymakers, the district education leaders, they can have conversations alongside them. And that be is because a culture, a very natural culture has been created that yeah. does not make them um, wish away the problems, but mm -hmm. take into account the challenges and mm -hmm. allow them to find ways of navigating around those very unique challenges that they might face in their yeah. setup. You know, I really love the the flexibility that you have talked about, modeling and having a woman, somebody who can relate to their challenges 
uh, and helping them is just really amazing. Um, Foster, let me let me get to you. You know, um, Dr. Erin had just mentioned, you know, those with smartphones, uh, we can do all the wonderful things that she had just talked about. We also have to recognize there are some people that are in the very rural area that do not have access to smartphones. I'm just wondering if you have any thought about how we might access and, and those people and how do we also make sure that they get in the, 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 the education they need, they need, the women and the youth, uh, so that they, know, they don't fall behind. Because as we all know, some of them went back home and they're really falling behind right now. What other tools do we have? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Eunice, you're probably not going to like me very much. Um, because I, I know you're all for digital and all. <laughs> uh, I, I, I have no problem with digital. And I think, you know, given where we, we are now, where we're going, you know, that's the only way to go. Uh, but I, I also get worried, you know, that somehow um, we, we're, we're doing almost the same things and tr trying to use the same tools that we had used in the past. Mm -hmm. you know, to solve what I call the 20th century pro problems, mm -hmm. you know, like in Gambia, you know, the Chamber of Commerce, you know, it's, it's almost charitable. Okay, there is a problem, you know, let's organize private sector or, or NGOs are going to solve that problem. And mm -hmm. then there is a less problem. Or, you know, uh, having ideas and tools to solve problems around women uh in in one society in one country i mean these are all good and these we have been doing for the last so many decades mm -hmm. um you know we have been focusing on sort of uh micro projects you know supporting women supporting supporting the youth but we are still where we are you know so i mean i i like uh Eunice's, uh take on you know rather starting to look at a holistic you know, approach and, and maybe more collaborative approach to solving this. Now, directly to your question, um, I'm almost sure that we can provide mobile phones to every single woman and every single young person in the continent tomorrow. But that will not solve the problem that, that, they, that they still have. Mm -hmm. But these mobile phones are supposed to be used for something. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, I mentor a lot of uh, young um, young men and women in the continent on innovation and entrepreneurship, and oftentimes, you know, you find a lot of these young people, you know, in the in the in the mobile space, you know, in the app space. And I tell them it's okay that the woman in in Ghana, you know, uh, who is a farmer, has a mobile phone that she can check the weather, you know, and he can check where, which where to get right inputs. But my problem is that woman still has a baby on her back, you know, and using the hoe to till the land. So mm -hmm. how does having a mobile phone help, the, help, help that woman? Mm -hmm. She's still not productive. Yeah. You, know, you, can still, you can have the mobile application that the woman can sort of make a contribution or we make contributions among themselves for savings and insurance. But at the end of the day, that woman will remain selling those tomatoes that don't bring her much. In. So my, my point is that we need to actually look at, you know, start to seriously look at the fundamentals. And I agree with you, Eunice, you know, to look at the fundamentals, you know, uh, and not just assume that, okay, once we go digital and we bridge the digital uh, divide, which we may never, or it may take a long time. So I don't think that is a goal that, that should be for us, but it should be about, you know, how we can use digital, you know, based on where we are to solve these problems. And then, and then again, use that to, to go forward. And not compared to, you know, um, you know, chasing where others are. I mean, they are there because they need a digital, you know. And I, 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 I also use the example of um, it generally in, in development that we continue chasing the countries that have six lane highways, for example, you know, in our capitals, and because of that, we need six lane highways, you know. Meanwhile, the people that would that would travel on that high, on those highways don't even have the means. So my suggestion is, yes, we should push for digital, but I will start, I will take a step backwards and, and look for the digital that we make in Africa, not the digital that we just learn to use, because digital does not just mean a mobile phone, you know, that we can make, and that can also create jobs and involve women in, in making this and, and, and using this. And I think my, my last point on this is that even in the digital world, we should encourage more collaboration you know, because we see pockets of activities, you know, in, in Ghana, in Gambia, in, in Kenya, in all parts. And everybody is doing a good job. 
But then at the end of the day, you know, these pockets actually don't grow together, you know, to move the continent forward. And as a culture, you know, we, we, we don't collaborate very much because we are all competing for the same resources from somebody. But we need to realize that if we can collaborate and we can learn lessons from, from one another, you know, lessons from Gambia, lessons from Unis, you know, if we can learn it from one another, you know, and, and, and find continental best practices, we will do a lot better. So it's not just about distributing digital mobile phones or, you know, creating the space for that, but it needs a lot more fundamental and collaborative approach to supporting the youth and, and women. Yeah. Uh, you know, you are very right around the collaboration. And unfortunately, I guess that's, you know, in our country in Africa, it's individual countries doing things, but I thought, I feel like we can be much more powerful and much more effective if we're all putting our resources, put our head together and, and, and as you, uh, you know, achieve really unbelievable result. So I, I, I do not know, like, you know, it's a very important point. And I think in all sectors, it's not just education and it's everywhere. And I'm just curious, you know, and maybe David, you can uh, uh, get your thought, but I would like to hear from all of you guys. What? How can we move to that? Towards that? What? What is keeping Africa from that collaboration? I'm sure there's some collaboration, um, but then how can we just enhance that? Well, um, I mean, collaboration is, is possible. You know, I think a lot of visions have been shared uh, across the continent. We're now talking of um, Vision 2063, um, and this is possible. But I mean, governments, uh, leaders. Uh, people, all stakeholders, have to be committed. You know, you know, we have to move from from decisions to actions. I think without commitment, uh, you know, our problems will not be solved as a continent. And and this is something that you know we all have to agree with, especially when we know that there are so many issues that have to be addressed. From you know physical infrastructure, there are so many physical infrastructural. Um, challenges that are across the continent from from electricity you know issues from you know issues relating to addressing from issues relating to, to net network network issues issues related to road network and you know we look at also other digital you know infrastructural issues um, the cost of internet is is very high in in some African countries including you know my country the, the Gambia so, you know, quality internet is also an issue. So when we look at all these things, it doesn't require a one size fit all. I think we have to be really innovative in, in addressing our problems as a continent. But one thing that is lacking is uh, commitment. We now see that the Africa continental free trade is coming into force in, in January. And I believe you, if, if we are not committed as a continent, you know, we will not be able to achieve this. The other issue that I see is that um, the technology that we use, most of the technology that we use in the continent are not owned uh, by Africans. So we really have to ensure that we, we build the right human capital um, to be able to ensure that we are producing and owning intellectual properties of the technologies that we are using in Africa. And uh, this will really enhance issues of job creation and, and economic development and growth. So, and I think that if we are able to be committed and speak with one voice and act with one voice, we have been speaking with one voice as a continent, but are we acting as one voice as a continent? And if we can answer this question and make it happen, I can tell you we will see changes. I guess just to um, yeah. respond to some of the, I think where the discussion has gone somehow, there's, you know, there's, there's, a, the, the, there's a big question that's being asked around how do you create system change, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's between, is it, you know, bottom up, do you empower each individual in different ways? I love the stories that and, 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 uh, Irene, Dr. Irene shared where she's talking about these individual women moving from, I don't know, I'm t I don't know how to use technology, um, to I'm now confident I'm actually leading and I'm able to, you know, being empowered to organize my day and actually um, take on other, manage other responsibilities I have to conversations of how do we create intergovernmental, you know, collaboration. And I think usually uh, in a lot of this debate around system change, the answer almost always comes to you need a, a, you need a bit of both, right? 
so you need the you need the entrepreneurs or creating you know the, the apps as well because the thing with the story and this is what i've seen from my work with uh with entrepreneurs and and, and, and female entrepreneurs in particular is that story of you know that woman in in the garden with her with her mobile phone sometimes what happens i'm not saying in all the cases is that she's exposed to more information she sees more market prices about other goods she then says, oh, I'm now not going to only grow tomatoes, I'm going to grow something else. And somehow this micro story can actually grow. And soon she's doing other things and empowering other women. So I think the whole goal is, you know, I'm not advocating for just simply digital technology is going to change that. You know, like I said, there's that holistic approach around changing culture, supporting with skills and, and opportunities to actually make those digital technologies work uh, for people. But I think that... I think that what I, I think the point I want to emphasize is as we talk about you know policy and collaboration at international level is not to to undermine how these small changes and some of the stories like you know like Erin shared a very specific example how those empowerment stories from the grassroots from the individual le level actually build up and support uh, uh, the, the policy because ultimately where will the policy come from who because it's going to be made by people. Who are these people? Who, whose voice decides what that is? And I think it's how do you empower individual voices to be a part of shaping that as well. But I think that's just what I want to contribute to the story, is that it has to be both bottom-up and top-down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, maybe just to, yeah, thank you. Just to add to this, and of course, I'm, I'm going to always want to use illustrations from our program. So collaboration is a, is a big word. And I think sometimes uh, perhaps our education system has played a role in um, engendering competition. Because if you remember, uh, for many of us being in school, it was always about the number one and the number two and the number three. And when you're sitting in your class, please um, cover your book so that the person next to you does not see what it is that you're writing. And and there's always that stardom that we that was built in us right from when we were young within our education system. Because naturally, as Africans, we are very collaborative. We live in communities. We we think about our, I mean, originally we thought about our uncles and our cousins and all that, and those sharing. So I think uh, one of the things that we are conscious about is that education system could play a role as uh, as has been mentioned from the bottom up. That we need to reculture how. Uh, we shape conversations and, and look at our education spaces so that it's not so much a cutthroat environment and we, we reintroduce policies that are not so much about judging and ranking, but actually that are about nurturing um, um, environments that are communal and people, the, the children can grow up in their classroom seeing themselves as a community, coming up with class norms that promote um, everybody's participation and values everybody's voice in that conversation. And I think what we have seen in our, in our program, because uh, first of all, if we go back to the context of COVID, there's a way that COVID could actually promote this. I mean, the realities brought about by COVID could actually promote this collaboration or in a way it could take away. So I always smile when, of course, now kids say you can no longer share a pen, you can no longer share a book, you know, keep your book to yourself because you're trying to limit uh, infection, which is understandable. But on the other hand, what we have observed was that uh, just by bringing, for example, I mean, the teachers together on one WhatsApp group and they were from different uh, schools and now they are together. And I think the issue there is about uh, the skills that come with facilitating because it's not just putting them in the group, but having the idea and the understanding of what it is that you want to foster and build. So what happened is that the three months we had our teachers now on the WhatsApp groups and the first session, it was just about, you know, share your photo, talk about yourself, what do you teach and all that. And that started creating that sense of community. And then we had very structured conversation that was very controlled that we know this is what we're going to talk about. And of course, making sure because making sure there's an emotional connection. So there's a skill about how do you build in that emotional connection so that's just cold and dry. But other time, as schools have opened, and now we have brought them together into some form of physical meetings, so the kind of excitement that was there for them to physically meet one another. But one of the things that we are working on, which, as I said, I'm going back to the education space, is starting with the teachers themselves. I always joke and tell them that the teachers are the most difficult learners you can ever have, because teachers walk around with, I'm a teacher, I know. So when you, have, you want to sit me down to teach me, then it's almost going against the grain. So one of the things that we've had to try and help our teachers see, one is that aspect of a community. 
that um, reorientation that they can learn from one another. That mm. actually somebody will have to come from outside so that they say this person is more knowledgeable other, but the more knowledgeable other is that person who sits next to you in the staff room. There's something he or she knows and there's something you know, and when you come together, you have a better understanding and it's more, and it's more grounded because you'll be thinking from right where the situation, the things are unfolding. And then going back to class and helping them see in the same way, would like you to start making your learners see themselves as a community. Let them have norms. Let us find ways of not so much celebrating the number one, but so much celebrating the effort that we've put in the work and how much we work together. So I think, as, as just as we said, there will obviously be top up the policies, our leaders and all that, but we also need to find a way of reculturing or going back to where we were. And I think the education system has a role to play. If we can engender more of collaboration and less of competition, even mm -hmm. as parents, so that when it's not so much were you number one or were you number two, but you know what is it that you're still struggling in and you know and just celebrating our, how is it that this child is doing but also how the collective is doing then perhaps we could contribute to this need and and lastly as i talk about education for africa part of the challenge that we've had again when we talk about policies is that many times if country x is trying to talk about a new policy so in africa right now there's something called competency-based curriculum and almost every country is saying we're moving to competency-based curriculum. But if you read the policy papers, while their countries are started it ahead of the others in the continent, first of all, in most cases, there is no common definition of competency-based curriculum across the African countries. Mm -hmm. Second of all, when you read the policy papers, there's a lot of references of countries outside over there and not the country next door that started doing this so-called curriculum so that we can come next door. Kenya and come to Rwanda and Rwanda is reaching out to Nigeria and really finding local based solutions, creating platforms for our educationists to share their challenges and the innovative ways of dealing with those challenges. So I think the education space has a role and has a space to play towards injecting and enhancing collab the collaboration we'd love to see as a yeah. continent. Yeah. One of the spaces we could nurture that. Absolutely. And uh local solutions and uh, trying to get uh, you know um solution from other part of the world that may not really be fitting to our african setting i really love that for says is there anything you would like to add to that i uh, think she uh erin thank you you said a lot of you know of what i was thinking about that at the end of the day it's about it's about education but we also need to look at how we how we position education because as it is now, it's about literacy, uh, the, the way we see education, you know, that you, you go in there, then you get a formal qualification and you have a certificate and you go home and you're so excited and everybody claps for you. Um, and I think the, the competence-based approach or what I even move beyond and say the capability-based approach um, should, should be, is what should be encouraged. And it's not so much about how the curriculum is designed, but it's just sometimes it's a little case about how children are taught. Um, I had a case, it was actually in Gambia, you know, I was, I was in a hotel a breakfast table and I overheard a group of teachers who were apparently, you know, in the same hotel, they were attending a conference on how to teach mathematics. You know, so they were going on about all this and they were brilliant teachers. I could see nothing wrong with, with, with them. But I could see how they were struggling, you know, and discussing how difficult it is to teach these kids statistics, you know, to let the kids understand, you know, the, the statistics and the curriculum. So I said to them, wait a second. But because I remember how I was taught statistics. So I said, okay, wait a second. I mean, don't you think it's possible to use the same curriculum? But instead of going through the theoretical and conceptual models of statistics to a kid, why don't you design a system and say, okay, well, each kid every morning you know, write down what you ate for breakfast, you know, every afternoon, write down what you ate for lunch, you know, if you have lunch and an evening. At the end of the week, you know, let the children put these together and, and then look at it and say, ah, okay, I ate maize five times. Okay, so on the, on the average in a week, how, how, how often do I eat maize? You know, finding practical ways, you know, that, 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 that these kids can associate with, you know, and this is what I also meant by the, by the relevance. 
So, so Erin is absolutely right. You know, it's not just about what is taught, but it's also about how we teach this. And many of these competences, you know, uh, that that we feel that African youth, you know, lack in terms of creative thinking, you know, um, uh, future orientation, uh, self-efficacy and self-management. These are things that you don't teach in any course, you know, really. It's not something that you lecture, but it's something that teachers should also be taught and encouraged, you know, to use as tools as they train, as they, th as they train these kids. So it becomes part of their everyday life and they acquire these competences, not through necessarily the curriculum. So Erin uh, Aaron is right, and I agree. It's all about education, but it's about what we teach them, but more importantly, how we teach them. How we teach them. Absolutely. Sorry, if I just jump into that uh, about, I think, uh, um, the, an opportunity that COVID-19 brought in relation to that, and unfortunately we may have missed it, is that, as we said now, we were saying learning has been taken back home. Mm -hmm. And, um, for example, the radio programs are being done and all that. The, the part of the challenge I had listening to some of the radio programs or the TV programs, they were still very starred. They were still like, I'm teaching and I'm just using the examples that I've used in my classroom. Yet now the kids were learning within the home context. So they don't have the laboratory, but what is it that they have at home yes. that you can point them to and say, as mommy is cooking uh, the maize meal today, you go and see how the water is boiling and you might actually see what we're talking about, change of state and all that. So there was an opportunity that we had by the fact that COVID pushed learning back home that should have allowed us to make our teaching more illustrative and more connected to the day-to-day -day examples that really the kids, and I know there was a challenge about, you know, if it must teaching, you have the kids in the rural, you have the kids in urban, how do you balance, but you could get a middle ground. And I think we lost that because we were just, uh, many of us were just excited that we have radio lessons and we're just teaching them the way we teach them in class. But I think that was an opportunity there and there's still an opportunity because there's still the, there's a greater consciousness that learning can take, happen at home. And so we need to push those examples and those rele the relevance of what we're talking about like what first is. That's right. And then, you know, um, that's what I was thinking about earlier when I was talking to Foster around those kids in the rural area. Uh, how can we use, because, you know, you're right, maybe not internet, they don't have internet, they do not have the smartphone, but what else can we use, like the radio, like the television, right? And using their day-to-day -day activities to teach them that. I really love that, uh, Dr. Irene, so that's really fantastic. Um, I just wanted to add that, uh, to agree with uh, Austin and, and Dr. Irene. I think the point that's being made around sort of Africans valuing African, I think, in all of these mm -hmm. things, you know, kind of taking steps back because it kind of made me think of uh, my husband is from the UK and, you know, he was teaching in, in, in Uganda, which is where I'm from, for some years. And he said, it's amazing that you would actually go to a school and it, they've learned in the textbook about a leaf and the patch of a leaf and the teacher has never gone outside to get a leaf and actually show them this is a leaf. <laughs> there, was this, there was this mindset that education is in books. Yes. There is a way to education and some foreign thing out there and what is yours local is not good enough what is maybe foreign and it kind of ties in a few points that have been made around creating local innovation that works for us around creating tools that are ours and i think just coming through the conversation i think that's when we go back to saying there needs to be a culture shift i think that's part of that it's kind of valuing what we have and kind of seeing you know kind of realizing even those global powers can face the same problems than us. I think that's one thing COVID has highlighted, that no one is above all of these things, you know. Um, and there are some African countries that have done much better than some of, you know, the, the global superpowers. So I think hopefully this kind of shows us that, you know what, no one will always have the answers. We can also be our own, have our own solution. Yeah. So just I wanted to agree with, with, with all of you and kind of say that that's yeah. kind of stuck out for me. Uh, Absolutely. Point. Absolutely. Um, I see a, a question just just came up. Um, so how do we how do we con invoke confidence in our cap capabilities as African countries in terms of creating or developing educational system that respond to our context? Why do we always look outside for any systematic solution to our challenges? I think that's what we were just talking about. <laughs> uh, but I wonder if uh, David, is there anything that you would like to add there? Yes. Um, what I would like to add there is. Um, as a continent, uh, there are challenges, but uh, there are opportunities. Uh, we have seen also 
some sectors that uh, young people are in, uh, especially women, like um, those in, in the creative sectors. We've seen some of them have been producing face masks. We've seen others in the pharmaceutical sector who've been, you know, making hand sanitizers. Uh, these have been opportunities unlike only those in the ICT sector. And I'll, I'll agree with my colleagues um, who've really um, highlighted the issue of um, policy. And, um, you know, my only worry I have is that most of the time our policy measures are related to the finance or the funding that is available coming from outside. So most of the time, I think we should really refocus uh, our policy issues to really um, impact and results, because uh, not only to availability of financing to finance particular activity, but if that activity doesn't give us impact and results, I think we as Africans should not agree to it. So we have uh, Africans should really come together, and uh, this is why I'll always highlight the issue of commitment because uh, it's true we have to collaborate from government to civil society, private sector, academia, we have to really collaborate. But if we are not committed towards ensuring that the policies that we put in place are really addressing our concerns, our issues, and the impact that we want to see as a continent, but not only the funding that is available. Uh, believe me, we will not see the Africa that we want. So this is what we really need to refocus, especially the young people who will live to witness and see Agenda 2063. We have to stand up to this and ensure it happens. Well said, David. Um, we have about four minutes left. Any last minute, uh, Todd Foster? You would like to add? Yes, and I think that was that was a, that's a good question. I think um, that orientation starts with us, you know. Um, and I'm as guilty as many of us, you know, being being an African who studied in other other countries, mostly Europe or, or North America, you know. So we come back home, you know, with sort of the orientation that we need to have and to create what is there. You know, um, and we make policies and programs, you know, and projects based on the worldview that we have, we have, we have come back with. But mm -hmm. I think we have a responsibility, you know, that to 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 encourage our youth because I think, you know, usually as Africans, we are so busy mm -hmm. uh, and extremely busy, what chasing what others have that we don't, mm -hmm. you know, that we fail to recognize what we have that we can build on, mm -hmm. you know. So the starting point for us to say, oh, this is how it's, it's done in Germany, this is how it's done in the U.S., it's, it should it not matter. How mm -hmm. should it be done in, in, in Africa? Yeah. And if we, as, 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 you know, experts and maybe older generation like me, you know, if we can identify our role in contributing to this mm -hmm. and starting to ch change the orientation that this is Africa, no matter where we were, we are back home. And this yeah. is that context. And, and, and you what is in the context to make it work. Absolutely. I appreciate that. Eunice, I just saw that you had a very good point on the, on the chat. Would like to have some last minute word? I was just, you know, kind of commenting. Someone asked, why, why is this this way? And I was just saying, you know, it's, it's to do with the legacy of our education system. When you think about how, you know, education as we know it, you know, you go to school, you know, the first school for missionary schools, and it was kind of, even I in school was still learning about, you know, the Canadian prairies, you know, very foreign-based curricula. It's, things are starting to change, yeah. but I think hopefully, you know, COVID has kind of shown us the, the, that also these, you know, these people that we look up to, these countries look up to are human as well, and they can struggle as well. Um, and so hopefully that gives us the confidence now to kind of say, right, we need to kind of look. And, and when they have their own fires to fight, they'll forget about you. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully then, that kind of gives us a confidence to say that actually, you know, and I loved, you know, some of the, you know, the, the, the information that was coming out of Africa at some point. It was, you know, this country is actually benchmark for the world in terms of how to approach this. So I think um, one of the, I guess, and I just call it an opportunity that's come out of, of this pandemic is really in showing the shared humanity we have and kind of showing that we as well can contribute to, to, to global solutions. And I think that hopefully will catalyze the shift towards um, uh, this change in, in mindset that we want to see. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the last word goes to Dr. Herin. Anything you would like to close on? <laughs> oh, you're on mute. 
I think um, there's so much that we talk about listening to what everybody's saying at the parting shot. One of the things that I would love us as a continent to look at, uh, in addition to digital, is we still have textbooks playing a key role in learning. And I think uh, there is a lot to reform in those textbooks because they are the ones that that child who doesn't have a, um, a phone might use. But the question is, what's their quality? And how can they be shaped to play a better pedagogical role? and yeah. still support teaching and learning. Thank you. That's right, or even creating our own textbooks. Um, yes. We are exactly at time. I feel like this conversation could go on and on. It's so interesting and so uh, inspiring. Just wanted to thank you so much. We are exactly at time right now, but really appreciate your being here and your thoughtfulness. And uh, I'm really hoping that, you know, we get this and create something better for our, our dear continent. And I think there's a lot of, possibilities here. I love the idea about the education starting from the bottom bottom up and empowering our youth, our women, but also working with the government just like to for those policy phases. So really appreciate it. Thank you so much for everything and thank you for being here.